Okay, welcome back. This is Rabbi Jeff Sachs of Atir and Web Yeshiva with another installment in our History of Halacha in 100 Objects. And tonight, although it may not appear that way, we're taking a little deviation because we're talking about the Talmud, not Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, uh, as an uh, object of study, as an object of veneration, as the kind of central focus and corpus and curriculum of traditional Jewish learning, um, but the Talmud object itself, you know, this book, the kind of, uh, the kind of thing that Jewish people uh, keep around the house in a variety of formats. This is a small desktop size, and whether we're talking about the conventional set of the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, or what's conventionally known as the Gemara, um, in its kind of familiar uh, guise, this object, this ritual object, uh, we have to admit that it is not a ritual object like the things we have looked at previously, like Sitzit, or even a Kos Shel Bracha, or... Uh, or um, Hmm. What are some of the other things you've seen? Perhaps you can help me remember, just by way of review. Hmm? No? Yes, that's right. Fill in and Kosel Bracha and Sitzit and Mizuzah. Uh, these are the things that we've looked at until now. Next week, we'll look at the Hanukkiah, the Hanukkah menorah, uh, uh, in advance of uh, in advance of um, of Hanukkah coming up. Uh, the the Talmud Bavli itself, although we treat it with respect and uh, according to our uh, practice, uh, uh, a Gemara that would be worn out, whose pages would be torn, which would no longer be really uh, useful for study. Uh, isn't merely discarded, but is put into Geniza for storage. But the the book itself, the book itself is not a mitzvah object in the same way as, let's say, tefillin are. If one wants to perform the mitzvah of tefillin, he needs access to a kosher pair of tefillin. Uh, the Gemara, like all of our all of our uh, books for Torah study. Um, with the exception of the Torah scroll itself, the book itself, while it has sanctity because it contains uh, God's holy name, because it contains holy writings, is merely instrumental in allowing us access to its knowledge. So whether we are studying off of the, there it is, the iconic page of uh, the Talmud, We'll talk about how it took this shape and form momentarily, or whether we're using some kind of newfangled app uh, that allows us to do it. Uh, the essence, although traditional sentiments might might uh, dictate uh, for something that looks a little more like that, we have to admit that uh, the uh, the app uh, might do the job job just as well, and in some ways might be superior. This is a matter of uh, taste and societal norms. Uh, you know, uh, I personally am a little bit old-fashioned, even though I stand at the head of something called the Web Yeshiva. I'm a little bit of a Luddite in these regards. I've never listened to an audio book or uh, I would never read a book off of a device, a Kindle or something like that. To me, the physical property of being in touch with binding and paper is still central to the experience of reading and, and, and to a certain degree learning, although we have to admit it's extremely convenient to have access to all these electronic resources. My point being that one who studies Gemara off of something that looks like this it fulfills the mitzvah identically to one that studies the same Gemara off of something that looks like that. And uh, in that way, the Talmud itself is of instrumental value. The book itself is instrumental value in that it contains the information, but the mitzvah that we are doing, the Torah study itself, stands somewhat independent of the object itself, which is not the case with mezuzah, which is not the case with tefillin. 
um, the uh, the history of the Talmud text itself is an interesting one. But what the Talmud, what the Gemara itself means as a mitzvah object um, was articulated very in a very lovely way years ago by the American Jewish literary critic Leon Wieseltier. Uh, when Rabbi Steinzaltz's Gemara, uh, the Steinzaltz Gemara, uh, um, was first being published in English back at the end of the 80s. On the front cover of the December 17, 1989 New York Times book review, there was a review essay about the Talmud in English written by Wieseltier. Now, it happened that that was a, something of an aborted project. Uh, a few volumes of the Steinzaltz Talmud uh, came out in English, you know that Rabbi Steinzaltz, uh, he should live and be well, uh, undertook to translate the Talmud into contemporary Hebrew and to give a kind of contemporary uh, commentary on the Gemara in order to open this book, much of which is of course written in Aramaic, um, to contemporary Israelis, uh, you know, in the way that the art scroll phenomena has done for the English-speaking world, and now Art Scroll itself has entered the, the Hebrew publishing world, uh, and those Gemarot were being translated into English, and it was an aborted project, and then only in the last, oh, two or three years, the Korain publishing house here in Jerusalem, in partnership with Rabbi Steinzaltz, has been putting out the Korain Steinzaltz Talmud in English, and that seems to have been quite uh, successful. Uh, so Wiesel here in this review essay, writes the following. Judaism is poor in images, proudly poor because images would become idols. But a culture cannot live without images. For Jewish culture, the task was to find an image that will not become an idol. A word is such an image. A text is a holy thing that will not be worshipped. That's an interesting idea, something which will be holy, but which will not itself become worshipped. And we're reminded of the opening halachot in the Rambam's Hilchot Avodah Zarah, where he talks about this problem of the object of worship being, the object of sanctity being, being confused as an object of worship. So the Jew, therefore, words become images, became images, and the sight of a text became a spiritual experience. This experience, though, leads the spirits to questions as well as to answers. The sight of the word conducts the eye directly to the mind, which prefers reading it to seeing it. There is no more powerful sight in Judaism than a page of the Talmud. It daunts, teaches, scolds, tempts, pleases, defeats. It is a slap in the face of slovenliness and superficiality, meaning not the page itself, but the experience of trying to enter the page, to enter the text. It is the sight of tradition itself. On this grand and grueling page, the design of the widow Ram and the brothers Ram, who published what has become the canonical edition of the Babylonian Talmud in Vilna in the 1880s, time is abolished. We'll come back to the widow Ram momentarily. How is time abolished? On the page of the Talmud, rabbis of the first and second centuries are addressed by rabbis of the third, fourth, and fifth centuries, who are addressed by rabbis of the 11th, 12th, 13th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The page is the proof that they would have recognized one another. That, of course, is reminiscent of a very evocative passage in the writings of Rabbi Soloveitchik, which we've seen together in the past many times, about the symposium of the generations, uh, that the generations of Teachers and students of the text are, are in, in, in colloquia with one another through the page of study. The Talmudic page is the image, but also the instrument of continuity. These are the graphics of survival. The page's many authorities are arranged in a maze of right angles, wrapped around one another in an order that gives coherence to a whole culture in blocks of discourse, almost completely without punctuation and the other amenities of intelligibility. It is a large and bustling page. The ancients, the scholars of the Mishnah, are conspicuously elliptical code, the conspicuously elliptical code law that was completed around the year 200 
uh, uh, CE after zero, and the scholars of the Gemara who completed their extraction of practical and philosophical meaning from the Mishnah around 500 CE after zero are in the center of the page where origins go in square, muscled letters that summon the student to a test of his reasoning and solidarity. The medievals and the moderns surround the ancients and tuck their minds into the wide margins that the page reserves for the future. Almost all of them in the more delicate and more dense Rashi script, the so-called Rashi script, amending texts, defining words, identifying sources, attacking contradictions, refining concepts. No fine print was ever finer. As the letters shrink and the perplexities grow, dreams of originality dim. The student learns how large is the debt that creativity owes to commentary. That's a, just a beautiful, evocative description of what the Gemara is as an object. He mentions in passing here Rashi script, which, which we'll come back to again momentarily. It's important to uh, remember, of course, this is what Hebrew in a contemporary font, Hebrew block print uh, looks like. It more or less approximates what uh, the letters look like in the Torah scroll itself, in the mezuzah scroll itself. This is the so-called Rashi script, which was, which was um, designed as a font in the 15th century. Rashi, of course, died at the very beginning of the 11th century. So for generations of students uh, that had trouble mastering the italics of Rashi print, Rashi script. Uh, it's important to remember that Rashi himself uh, might not have immediately recognized these symbols as the letters that we know. Um, and it was designed by the printers in order to create a different font, a font to set off the Rashi commentary from the main text, be it the biblical text or the Talmudic text. Um, but this idea, let me go back a moment, this idea of that he that he uh, he evokes of the this idea that he evokes of the Talmud page, the maze of the Talmud page. Uh, you know, almost as a kind of visual symbol of the maze that the study is, that we enter the maze and we can wander around in it and not always immediately find our, our way out, that the commentaries kind of tuck themselves in around the margins, that, uh, that, a, whole, that a whole body of source working and commentary and super commentary uh, keeps growing. And then, of course, that which won't fit on the page uh, is relegated to the pages in the back and to a whole library of ancillary commentary, you know, is the, is the thing which makes the Gemara itself the puzzle that it is, that the Mishnah text becomes set off from the Talmudic text, the rest of the page, and you enter into this multi-generational conversation of 2nd century and 5th century and medieval rabbis and more modern commentaries that are all puzzled, pieced together onto one page is, is just such a beautiful description. The, uh, of course, before printing, uh, printing begins, of course, with Johann Gutenberg. Gutenberg lived and flourished uh, in the first half of the 15th century. He's credited with... He looks here. He looks like a combination between a Hasidic Rebbe and Genghis Khan. I have no idea if this is in any way an authentic image of him. But this woodcut to the right uh, is is a uh, I, I think a 
15th century uh, woodcut that that depicts the first you know the first type of wooden printing press uh, using movable type, which was of course Gutenberg's great innovation, which so revolutionized civilization as we as we know it. You now, when we think about think about you know the changes, you know, in our own lifetimes, in the past 20 years uh, of of the internet, of social networking, of everything that the wired world has wrought in the last 20 years, um, how it has so radically changed information and communication and, and, and social structure and, and everything, it, it really does pale in comparison to the, to the innovations wrought by Gutenberg and his printing press, although by definition that was a revolution that took a little longer to manifest itself throughout the world, even throughout the Western world. And the electronic revolution has been much more fast. Uh, but in terms of its scope, I dare to say that uh, Gutenberg's, Gutenberg's innovation was, was uh, even more impactful. Jewish inconabula. Inconabula is the uh, word, which literally means in Latin, in the cradle, is books that were published, were printed, I should say, printed on printing presses before the year 1500. So the first half century or so of printing, um, of printing, uh, uh, that's the, the kind of home base, the origin of, of any type of printed book. Of course, Gutenberg's most famous product was the Gutenberg, the Gutenberg Bible. Um, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen one, there are you know a few, a few dozen in existence. Um, you know, in different museums around the world. Although none, we don't possess one here in in Jerusalem. But the Gutenberg Bible is, you can see it. I've seen it at the Smithsonian, is at the New York Public Library. Uh, it really is uh, an incredible thing to view. Um, but the first, um, the first, the first um, Hebrew book published, which was, we believe, in 1475, was Rashi's commentary on on the Bible. Uh, was the first Hebrew book published. But very quickly, the Talmud became a kind of focus of Jewish publishing, and to a certain degree, it became the the uh, the bar uh, the standard by which a Jewish publisher uh, would measure himself to produce a a a printed Talmud. Of course, prior to printing, uh, uh, the Talmud was written in manuscript, and there are a variety of different Talmud manuscripts. Um, uh, available. I'm going to put up in the in the chat box two different links. One is to uh, an online exhibit that was a, an exhibit at the uh, Yeshiva University Museum at the Jewish Museum in downtown Manhattan a few years ago, which was an exhibit on the printing of the Talmud. And um, at that website, there's a variety of very interesting essays that you can read by Jewish scholars on the history of the printing of the Talmud, the history of Talmud manuscripts, the, the role of Talmud study in Jewish life, uh, as well as uh, the exhibit the images of the exhibit pieces themselves, which are a variety of Talmud manuscripts and printed Talmud, Talmudim and, and other things. And then a link to the National Library of Israel in Jerusalem, the manuscript collection, that allows you to see uh, uh, scans of famous, important Talmud manuscripts. This is the Firenze manuscript from the 12th century uh, handwritten manuscripts. We're aware of the problems of handwritten manuscripts. We're aware of the problems of errors that, uh, that creep in. We're also aware of the problem of price. It's extraordinarily expensive to produce a 
handwritten manuscript of an entire Talmud volume, or any other book for that matter, and it's even more expensive to produce a handwritten manuscript of the entire Talmud. Uh, so expensive that very, very few people could have it. And in the Middle Ages, prior to, prior to printing, uh, there were probably rabbis and great scholars that were not in possession of the entire Talmud. I can walk around with the entire classical Jewish bookshelf on my iPhone. Uh, uh, I have multiple copies. I own multiple copies of the printed editions of the entire Talmud. Desktop sizes, large sizes, uh, Talmud in translation, etc. This is accessible and available to most people. It is estimated it is estimated that uh, that printing uh, in the general book market, not specifically in the Jewish book market, which of course is a smaller market and the economy of which and the supply and demand of which, and of course would not be identical to that of the general book market, but it's, it's estimated that in the 15th century in Rome, uh, the general book market, a, a printed book cost 20% of what a equivalent manuscript would have cost. So if we assume that the Jewish book market was not too different, we don't know exactly what a manuscript of a volume of the Talmud would have cost, but the printed edition, once it becomes available, would have been just 20% of that. And in other places outside of Rome, uh, which was of course a, a center, uh, it was even, even cheaper. It was in some places only one-eighth the price of a, of a manuscript. And then later in the 16th century, the, um, the value uh, became even more affordable. Because in the 16th century, salaries rose, income rose, but for a variety of reasons, book prices did not rise relative to income, to a person's disposable income. And, uh, and so it became even more affordable to buy printed books. Of course, when we talk about people buying printed books, we're obviously only talking about a certain class of people who even at the great value of you know, only 20% the cost of buying a manuscript could now buy a printed book. Um, only certain people would be oriented to do so. Only certain people were properly literate in order to have any value from a printed book uh, at all. Of course, you'll notice in the manuscripts of the Talmud, uh, the manuscripts generally contained only the text of the Talmud, Mishnah and the Talmud itself. And in order to study commentaries, we are so accustomed that the Talmud, definitionally, uh, as Weasel Tear described, the Talmud is accompanied by Rashi on the inside margin, Tosfot on the outside margin, a whole variety of super commentaries surrounding them, and a whole variety of other commentaries uh, appended to the back, but in the days of manuscript, if you were studying this volume of Talmud and you wanted to study the commentary of Tosfot on it, Tosfot was purchased in a separate manuscript, this one on Masechet Sachim from the 14th century, and you would need two fingers to keep one on the, to keep one on the, page, on the page of Talmud and one on the Tosfot, and that's why we have the the convention of the Dibur HaMatchil, the opening word, uh, which is a, a quote, a reference to where in the Talmud uh, this line of Tosfot is commenting on, so that you know how to connect the two dots, the kind of equivalent of what today we have with a hypertext link. Um, so you would need a separate volume of Rashi, you would need a separate volume of Tosfot. As a matter of fact, you may be familiar with the idea that Tosfot himself or themselves uh, refer to Rashi as the Kuntris, as the notebook, because the Tosafot, the Tosafists, 
which of course in the first generation were the were the grandchildren and great grandchildren of Rashi and their students and followers possessed the Talmud manuscripts and they possessed Rashi's commentary on the Talmud in separate machbarot or notebooks or kuntrasim and they would need two fingers, one on each manuscript to follow along. Um, the, the, here's a Geniza fragment from the Cairo Geniza uh, of, in this case, the Mishnah in Baba Metziah. Uh, these were written manuscripts that were, of course, uh, uh, very precious and valuable and expensive, and therefore only accessible to a certain class of people. Once printing begins in the 15th century, this is the map of the centers of printing the Talmud, although it's, uh, yeah, it's a map of the centers of printing the Talmud. Uh, we'll come back to it in a second, but we'll see that Sino becomes very important, Venice becomes very important, and then later, Vilna to the north. These are the three areas we're going to, to focus on. The, the Sansino, uh, the Sansino uh, 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 publishing house, which, um, which really sets the contours and the template of what a page of Talmud looks like. The first printed editions of the Talmud were produced by the Sansino house, a family, a multi-generation family of, of Jewish printers. Um, and there are certain things, certain features that, uh, certain features of the layout of their Talmud, which remain to this day. Um, uh, Rashi is always printed on the inside margin. And Tosfot is always printed along the outside margin of the text. Uh, this is an important, this was a, was a fateful decision to include the commentary. It's, it's almost unimaginable. If a publisher is going to decide to include on the, on the text, which was, by the way, the fashion of medieval publishing, uh, in, in, in Christian holy texts, uh, which after all was a much larger market, in Christian holy texts, this is the fashion to publish commentary on, on biblical texts and other things there on the page. But the decision of what to include, it's almost unimaginable that if a publisher is going to decide to include commentary, included there directly on the page and not appendixed in the back or in a separate standalone volume, it's unimaginable that Rashi would not have been included. If a poll would have been taken, uh, I don't know that the Sancino Publishing House did any market research. I don't know if that was a concept uh, back then. But if they did, it would have been obvious that, that the most useful thing to do would be to include Rashi on the page. Rashi unlocks the Talmud. Without Rashi, the, the, uh, the Gemara is, is, is almost an impenetrable uh, fortress, um, and our debt to him is, is immeasurable. It was less obvious that Tosfot would be included on the page. And here, you really do see the relationship between medium and message. Tosfot's commentary on the Gemara is an attempt to synthesize the entirety of the Talmud. To look at this particular page and to question what it's saying and what its conclusions are in light of the entirety of the rest of the Talmud. Rashi is much more focused on helping us work our way through line by line on the page that we're on now. Tosfot is interested in trying to figure out what the implications of this line here 
are with every other line in Shas that's relevant to this discussion. That creates a dynamic of study, a type of dialectical tension that's almost synonymous with what Gemara study is. It preserves a tension which is there in the lines of the Gemara itself. For after all, the Gemara, to a certain degree, was doing this with the Mishnah. What does this Mishnah mean in light of what we know about what the Tanaim, the rabbis of the Mishnahic period, said in a different source and trying to resolve conflicts and trying to, trying to reconcile different traditions? So Tosfot kept that kind of style alive. The decision to put Tosfot on the page had long-lasting curricular implications. It meant that, to a certain degree, the study of Gemara was the study of Gemara, Rashi, and Tosfot. You can imagine a parallel universe in which history unfolds differently, where in the commentary of the Ran, an extremely important commentary on the Gemara, which is usually appears appended in the back of the Talmud, where you flip the reality in the parallel universe and Tosfot is relegated to the back, to the appendix, and the Ran appears on the page, and it changes even subtly the nature of what Gemara study is. I don't want to speculate how the world would look differently or how yeshiva study would look differently, but I, I have no doubt that it would have been. So this decision made by the Sansinos, by the publishing house, we call them the Sansinos, they were from a town called Sansino in northern Italy, um, but this decision by the Sansino house, you know, there's a, there's a contemporary Jewish publishing house called the Sansino Press, which is named, you know, in their honor. It is not a... Uh, it is not a continuation uh, from the 15th century of the same publishing firm. Um, so this decision by the Sincinos, uh, which became you know the default, the default uh, format of what of what a page of Talmud looks like, um, you know, re- remaining to this day, uh, was a very faithful one. In addition, in addition. Uh, they, uh, as an aesthetic decision, there are always, with very few exceptions where it's just not typographically possible, there are always four lines of commentary at the top of Rashi and or Tosfot, and then the commentaries are relegated to the side margins, and this, if we look if we look back here, this remains to this day. There are always four lines of Rashi and Ortos vote at the top prior to the beginning of the central text of the Talmud. This became a fashion it's not a matter of custom or of law, but it became a kind of aesthetic fashion that uh, that was instituted by by Sancino in the first printed editions of the Talmud, which remains uh, on on almost every page. There's some pages where there's no commentary of Rashi or Tosfot. Doesn't happen very often, but in, in um, uh, I don't know, I'm making this number up, but uh, you know, above 97 percent. The cases that is the template of what a page of printed Talmud looks like. The the first volume of printed Talmud, uh, the first volume of printed Talmud in the in the 1480s was Masechet Brachot, a logical choice. The first uh, the first volume in the in the order of the Shas is Brachot. So the first volume to be printed was Brachot. Uh, it did differ from the Gemara as we have it today. There were 117 unfoliated leaves, meaning pages were not, pages were not uh, numbered. Um, uh, there was no title page. The first page was left blank. Uh, 
and therefore the first page with text becomes page two, and that fashion remains to this day, that the first page of text in the Talmud is always daf bet omud aleph, page two, side A, because in the folio fashion of the folio fashion of of um, printing, each leaf is carries the same number. In, in, in our modern books, one side of a page is side one, the other side is side two. And the next page begins page three, and the back side of page three is page four. So the fashion in medieval manuscripts, medieval uh, 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 published books, was that each side is numbered A and B. So it, it's page 2A and page 2B, and then 3A and 3B, uh, and so on. I trust you're familiar with this. Um, so the custom is that the first page of text begins on page 2, and although this is not the real reason, it's not a historical reason, there is a kind of... Uh, moral, moralistic explanation that, of course, there's no beginning. There is no page one. You, you, there's no, Gemara has no beginning, it has no end. It's like a circle. You can jump in at anywhere on the circle and just keep moving around, but there's no beginning point, as it were. You enter the conversation at whatever point it, it's up to at that, at that point. Uh, there's, no, there's no necessary rhyme or reason to begin one's study of Gemara with the first page of Brachot and to move linearly. Um, but in fact, that's not the historical reason for this practice of labeling the first page, page two. It has to do with the fact that the first page was, la was, left, was left blank. Uh, Sincino, Gershom Sincino was his name, uh, made another very interesting choice, important choice, there were different manuscripts of Tosfot. Again, Tosfot, Tosfot was not a was not a person. It was a collective of students, and there were different manuscripts of Tosfot floating around Europe. And he made a decision to follow what's known as the Tosfot of Tok. Uh, the the word is spelled, it's a town in, if in fact this is the town that is largely um, believed to be, it's a, it's a town in, in Normandy. Oh wait, let me write that in a color that we can see. Nope, that's not right. Uh, according to most scholars, this is a town in Normandy in northern France. According to others, it might be a different town somewhere in, in Germany. But according to most uh, understandings, it's a, it's a town in northern France. In Hebrew, it's called Tok. Um, that that edition of Tosfot became the definitive Tosfot. There are, of course, other editions of Tosfot out there. Uh, that are available, that students in Yeshiva study from, but that set, that set the kind of uh, definition for what, for what Tosfot was, which Tosfot became the, the normative uh, set of Tosfot's commentary. However, Sonsino did not produce a full set of Talmud. Select volumes, select Mesechtot, were chosen and, uh, and were published, but they did not at least initially succeed in publishing an entire complete set of all of the Talmud, and that, that was left to Bomberg. Bomberg, Daniel Bomberg, and here's one of the ironies. Daniel Bomberg sounds like a Jewish name, doesn't it? Like you can imagine going to shul and sitting next to a guy named Daniel Bomberg. Uh, but Daniel Bomberg himself was a Gentile. Uh, Sonsino does not sound like, you hear Sonsino, it sounds like you know, a character out of one of the Godfather movies. Uh, Sonsino, the publishing firm of Sonsino, uh, was of course a Jewish family. 
but Daniel Bomberg was a non-Jew. It was not. It was a non-Jewish publisher who published a whole variety of uh, uh, of works, but became his publishing house became a very well-known Jewish publishing house in Venice. Uh, which was then a kind of center because it's very centrally located, of course, and distribution, even publishers today uh, worry about distribution because your books don't get into the hands of book dealers or bookstores today. Uh, it's hard to sell them. Even in, in the age of Amazon and the worldwide bookstore, distribution is still very important. Um, so situated in in uh, situated in Venice in the early 16th century, uh, Bomberg published a full set of Talmud between 1519 and 1523. Following some of the conventions that Sonsino had already established, Rashi in the middle, in, in the middle, I mean in the margin closest in the, in the margin closest to the binding of the of the work, Tosfot on the outer margin, the Mishnah and and Gemara text in the center, the the uh, template of four lines of Rashi and Tosfot text above the central text, but Bomberg, because of the layout of the page in the manner that he did it. Uh, uh, published the volumes in different pagination. And his pagination of the Talmud became the definitive, now almost 500 years later, we're, we're coming up, 1519, so in 2019 it'll be, the, it'll be the 500th anniversary of the Bomberg Talmud, or at least the beginning of the project. His pagination became and remains the universal pagination order, so that regardless of which edition of the Gemara you have, Steinsaltz or Art Scroll or, or the English Sonsino or the Bomberg Talmud or the Warsaw Talmud or the Vilna Talmud, you can go to any volume to the same page or the same page reference and it will contain the same text. That Daf Kof Gimel Omid Beis, page 23b, will begin and end with the same exact words and contain the same exact text and the same exact passages from Rashi and Tosfot as any other edition of the Talmud that ever ever was after him and likely ever will be. And this created the universal referencing system for the Talmud. Lahavdil, the way that scholars of Shakespeare can say uh, Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 3, Lines 18 to 24, and that's a universal referencing system to a specific passage in the text. The same way, by the way, that we can refer to a verse in the Bible. The, the division of the Bible into the chapters and verses, as they are universally uh, known today, is not initially a Jewish innovation. It was a Christian innovation for handy reference, but it's so handy that it was universally accepted even by Jewish scholars, so that one can refer to... Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 11, and universally we all know which, which pasuk that is referring to. So the universal pagination of the Talmud Bavli, innovated at the beginning of the 16th century by Bomberg, remains to today. And that also, that also is a case of medium and message merging. The idea of a vast array of material, so much so that if you study one page a day, it takes, famously according to the Dafyomi schedule, seven and a half years to go through the entirety of the Talmud. At a page a day, 
that a universal referencing system, certainly in the age before being able to carry it all around on your iPhone and just being able to Google it up and find any passage, any needle in the haystack you might be looking for, was a way of creating some level of reference, some level of mastery, some level of being able to correlate what was going on, which the Baalei Tosfo did not have. They had to do it the old-fashioned way. But we, who may not be up to snuff, have that kind of going for us that we have this universal referencing system which makes it handy to at least have a map uh, even though at the end of the day, you still have to do the hard work of learning it all on your own. We'll skip ahead many hundreds of years to the Vilna Shas. Of course, there were many other printings of the Gemara in between, uh, but for our purposes, the most important of the printed Talmudim is the Vilna Shas, which began publication in, uh, in the 1880s, was completed in 1886. Vilna, of course, was nicknamed, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, aspirationally, perhaps pejoratively, the Jerusalem of Lithuania, the center of Jewish learning at that point in Jewish history, uh, uh, produced this beautiful edition of the Talmud. Um, there was a fashion to you know, this kind of iconic image of this gate, which in different permutations, you know, still can be seen in different Jewish books as the, the what we call in English the title page, or in, in Yiddish, in Hebrew and Yiddish, it's called the, the, the Sharblat, or the Shardas, the gateway, the entranceway to the page, this kind of royal, dramatic-looking entree to the holy text, was traditionally published with these red letters, uh, uh, you know, books published in the 19th and even early 20th century. This is a fashion to publish the books with the, on the title page. You know, of course, it's, it's expense, more expensive to publish a, a, a page in two different colors because it has to be run through the press twice. You need to re-ink the press with the red ink and run it through a second time to to add the, the color. Um, so it was usually reserved only for the title page as a kind of decorative. And But again, the, 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 these kinds of folk ideas of red representing the blood of Jews who were prepared to, to give their lives you know, for the study of Torah or literally to indicate that, uh, that the holy words and these holy texts were the lifeblood of the Jewish people. This, these are folk uh, explanations for for uh, for certain uh, material customs, but they're powerful explanations. The Talmud Bavli here's uh, first edition, uh, first page of of Masechet Brachot. So here's Masechet Brachot, the decorative box around the opening, the opening word, the uh, the um, the now already universal convention of the top carrying the, the number of the chapter. This is the first chapter. The name of the chapter called almost always after the opening word or opening phrase of the first Mishnah, Me'emotai, the title of the Mesechta, Mesechet Brachot, Bet, to indicate that you are on page 2, in this case 2A, um, this is the iconic page of Talmud, which was reproduced in photo offsets for a hundred years. For almost a hundred years, uh, almost all editions of the Talmud were merely offsets <coughs> of the Vilna Shas. At the end of the 20th century, printers began to reset it in laser type and, uh, you know, to improve the clarity and the aesthetic, but the template was not altered. Sometimes down to the the very line. That if uh, here on uh, on on 
on uh, in the toast vote, if you were to go down one, two, three, four, five lines, uh, the first word on the line will be shalosh. Uh, that it'll correspond exactly, uh, but just improved visually and and graphically, um, and with very few changes or editions, contemporary editions of the Talmud in the iconic. Vilna Shas um, correspond to to this. The, uh, of course, very interesting. The Vilna Shas was the the product of the publishing house of the widow Devora Ram, uh, as she was almost universally known. She was the widow of the owner of the publishing firm. Um, um, and uh, unusually, upon the death of her husband, David Ram, in 1862, uh, she took over the company and ran it together with her sons, and the, comp- and the company became known as the publishing house of the widow and brothers Ram. The, her husband was not the founder of the house. Uh, it had been founded in almost 100 years uh, uh, earlier. It was founded in 1789, it moved to Vilna in 1799. He was one of uh, 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 one of the descendants of the founding uh, founders of the company, and upon his death, she took it over. I mean, she looks like such an interesting woman, doesn't she? Um, this is this is the, the publishing house. This is a picture of the, the factory, the you know the where the, where the press. Was you can see there on this sign the words Rom R O M and Reish Aleph Mem, um, and uh, it was under this name of the widow and brothers Rom that the famous Talmud was produced, uh, completed in 1886. She died in 1903. When she died, her sons moved to America, and the company functioned under new owners until 1940, actually. When um, when the Soviet occupation of Vilna, Lithuania, uh, came and shut down the publishing house, and at that point, the center of Jewish publishing moved to America uh, and to other parts of uh, other parts of the world, namely Israel, or at that point Yerushalayim, not yet Israel proper, but. Uh, but in uh, the beginning of the 20th century, the center of Jewish publishing, of Hebrew publishing, I should say, was uh, was moved to America. Companies like the Hebrew Publishing Company and things like that, and the plates of the of of the Talmud Bavli were themselves, I think, ported to the United States, and the Vilna Shas continued to be published there, and then later in later in uh, in Israel until now of course everything is done computerized and and fancy the Talmud itself as an object really is venerated and not only venerated in some ways I'll now contradict myself I said at the opening that the, the book itself is not a mitzvah object in the same way as tefillin or mezuzah or or or, uh, or even a kiddush cup, because in order to make kiddush, you need something to hold the wine in. You can't just pour it out on the table and recite kiddush over the puddle of of wine. But on the other hand, the Talmud itself, and here we are nostalgic for books. We are people of the books. Not just the book, the holy book, the the Torah, but of all of the books, uh, we really are the most bibliophilic of of people. Um, the the anthropomorphization of the book. This is a theme that appears uh, here and there in the writings of Agnon, a drawing on other kind of folk tales of the anthropomorphization of the book of someone that gives himself over to the study of the study of a particular book. He's known as a character in a story who gives himself over to mastering one particular volume of the Talmud. Uh, 
so much so that he he the the the, the name of that the name of that volume I think it was Ta'anit Mesechet Ta'anit becomes his last name. Like he's known as I forget I forget the specific uh, name, but let's say his name is Rav Moshe, and he becomes known as Rav Moshe Ta'anit because he was the the master of Mesechet Ta'anit. He gained expertise in it. And when he dies, this mysterious woman shows up at the funeral, and no one knows who she is. And it was said that it was Mesechet Ta'anit herself, uh, anthropomorphized, who had come to who had come to bid him farewell. And the custom of reciting the Hadran at the end of the study of completing a, a volume of the Talmud, a Mesechet of the Talmud, we say. Hadran Allah Haroe Veslikala Mesechet Brachot. We will return to you. We will return to you. Hadran Allah Mesechet Brachot. We will return to you. Mesechet Brachot. Mesechet Ta'anit. Mesechet Kedushin. Mesechet Sanhedrin. Mesechet Mesechet Menachot. Right? We will. We, we, we're not finishing. There's no such thing as learning it and finishing it and being done with it. I remember when I was a kid in school. You know, you'd have those those workbooks. It's not the text. The textbooks always had to be returned at the end of the year, but the workbooks. You know that you did all the assignments in the last day of school. Whatever it was, the the social studies workbook, the the math workbook, the the, the garbage bins at the exit of the school would be overflowing with these books. Kids would just throw them away. It always used to bother me. I mean, maybe because I, I was a bookish type of kid, but it always used to bother me. You'd bring, I would bring them home. How can you throw a book? What any kind of book? How can you throw throw a, a book out? And at some point, I assume my mother got rid of them because who needs your third grade you know math workbook? But but the the idea that you just discard them? No, the books are books are precious. Uh, Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Gabirol, the medieval the medieval Jewish Hebrew poet, has a line where he says, "Sim chavarecha shvarim, make books your friend." Uh, he describes them as the flowers in your garden. Uh, so we'll come back to you, Masechet Brachot, v'hadrachalan, datanalach Masechet Brachot. Our mind is occupied with you. We're always thinking about you. The way that uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik described it is the way that you know a mother is always mindful of her baby, uh, particularly an infant who's who's uh, you know who's who's literally dependent on the mother in 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 ways that an older child isn't, uh, where the mother literally feels. Uh, physically, she feels the need to, to, to feed the baby uh, as the milk uh, is, is, is produced, uh, and that even if the mother leaves the baby, uh, you know, for for a few minutes or for a few hours, she's always mindful of the baby. Um, uh, it, it, she, it's always front and center in her in her mind. So that's what that's what our relationship to the Gemara is. And we hope you're thinking about us, right? The the idea that the Gemara itself is a is an entity, is as a consciousness. We won't forget you. You shouldn't forget us. Not in this world. Not in the not in the next. I'll just conclude with a beautiful story. I tried to find it, but the volume that it's in seems to have gone missing from my library. Uh, Rabbi Professor David Weiss Halivni, who's a very uh, important uh, academic scholar of Talmud, uh, uh, for many years at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, later at a different institution today. He lives in Yerushalayim and can be seen any day of the week in a, in, a, in a set spot in the National Library in Jerusalem, he was known in his youth as an ilui, as a as a prodigy, as a Talmud prodigy, and he was taken off to the camps uh, as a child in, in in the Holocaust. And he describes, you know, among the among the deprivations and the struggles and the trauma of being in a concentration camp. Uh, was he was cut off from Torah study. He was also cut off from food, and he was cut off from his family and other things, but he was cut off from learning Gemara. And one day, there's a Nazi soldier eating a sandwich, and the sandwich is 
is, you know, who knows, it's it's, it's a ham sandwich, it's the worst of the worst. And the sandwich was rather, the way that you would wrap up a sandwich like in a piece of wax paper, the piece of paper was a page of Talmud. The piece of paper was a page of Talmud, which had been desecrated and was being used as scrap paper in the kitchen to wrap up sandwiches with. And he's a little boy, and he sees this Nazi eating his ham sandwich wrapped up in a page, the way you'd like wrap up fish and chips with a newspaper in London, wrapped up in a page of Talmud, and the page of Talmud was covered in the grease of this ham sandwich. And he, he couldn't help himself. He, he knew that he was probably, you know, he, that he was not probably, he was just definitely risking his life. But he goes up to this Nazi and he says to him, listen, mister, I need that piece of paper. And the soldier, in a moment of, of mercy or in a moment of uh, uh, probably was just too dumbfounded, you know, to imagine what this little little Jew kid you know, wanted his sandwich wrapper for, uh, gives it to him. And he said he carried it around with him throughout the whole war. It was one page of grease-stained Talmud in the, in the book, his memoirs. Uh, uh, in English, it's called um, The Book and the Sword. The Book and the Sword by David Weishan Livni. Uh, he mentioned specifically which page of Talmud it was. He said that's what he had. He he just kept learning that one page of Talmud over and over again. He carried it with him, uh, and he describes that he assumes that uh, that page protected him, kept him alive, and it was enough to sustain him, to nourish him spiritually in the darkest moment in, in, in history. Uh, that is the power of the Talmud as an as a as a source of study, but also as a as an object, and uh, that is what we have dedicated our lives to to study and to think about. So that's that's the Gemara, that's the Talmud, and next week we'll talk about the Chanukiah before uh, Chanukah.